eel. Numerous muscular branches arise, at short intervals, from the vessel in its passage down the leg. Tarsal, metatarsal, and small digital branches spring from the dorsal artery of the foot. The anterior tibial artery is rarely found to deviate from its usual course, in some cases it appears of less or of greater size than usual. When this vessel appears deficient, its place is usually supplied by some branch of the perineal or posterior tibial, which pierces the interosseous ligament from behind. The anterior tibial artery when requiring a ligature to be applied to it in any part of its course, may be exposed by an incision, extending for 3 or 4 inches, more or less, according to the depth of the vessel, along the outer border of the tibialis anticus muscle. The fibrous septum between this muscle and the extensor communis, will serve as a guide to the vessel in the upper third of the leg, where it lies deeply on the interosseous ligament. In the middle of the leg, the vessel is to be sought for between the anterior tibial and extensor longus pollicis muscles. In the lower part of the leg, and on the dorsum of the foot, it will be found between the extensor longus pollicis, and extensor communis tendons, the former being taken as a guide for the incision. In passing the ligature around this vessel at either of these situations, care is required to avoid including the vena comites and the accompanying nerve. The sole of the foot is covered by a hard and thick INT egument, beneath which will be seen a large quantity of granulated adipose tissue so intersected by bands of fibrous structure as to form a firm, but elastic cushion, in the situations particularly of the heel and joints of the toes. On removing this structure, we expose the plantar fascia, B, plate 68, figure 1, extending from the OS calcis, A, to the toes. This fascia is remarkably strong, especially its middle and outer parts, which serve to retain the arched form of the foot, and thereby to protect the plantar structures from superincumbent pressure during the erect posture. The superficial plantar muscles become exposed on removing the plantar fascia, to which they adhere. In the center will be seen the thick fleshy flexor digit orum brevis muscle, B, arising from the inferior part of the OS calcis, and passing forwards to divide into four small tendons, BBBB, for the four outer toes. On the inner side of the foot appears the abductor pollicis, D, arising from the inner side of the OS calcis and internal annular ligament, and passing to be inserted with the flexor pollicis brevis, H, into the sesamoid bones and base of the first phalanx of the great toe. On the external border of the foot is situated the abductor minimi digiti, C, arising from the outer side of the OS calcis, and passing to be inserted with the flexor brevis minimi digiti into the base of the first phalanx of the little toe. When the flexor brevis digit orum muscle is removed, the plantar arteries, LM, and nerves, are brought partially into view, and by further dividing the abductor pollicis, D, their continuity with the posterior tibial artery and nerves, KL, plate 67, figure 1, behind the inner ankle may be seen. The plantar branches of the posterior tibial artery are the internal and external, both of which are deeply placed between the superficial and deep plantar muscles. The internal plantar artery is much the smaller of the two. The external plantar artery, L, plate 68, figure 1, is large, and seems to be the proper continuation of the posterior tibial. It corresponds, in the foot, to the deep palmar arch in the hand. Placed at first between the origin of the abductor pollicis and the calcaneum, the external plantar artery passes outwards between the short common flexor, B, and the flexor accessorius, E, to gain the inner borders of the muscles of the little toe, from this place it curves deeply inwards between the tendons of the long common flexor of the toes, FFF, and the tarsometatarsal joints, to gain the outer side of the first metatarsal bone, H, plate 68, figure 2. 
In this course it is covered in its posterior half by the flexor brevis digit orum, and in its anterior half by this muscle, together with the tendons of the long flexor, F, plate 68, figure 1, of the toes and the lumbricals muscles, III. From the external plantar artery are derived the principal branches for supplying the structures in the sole of the foot. The internal plantar nerve divides into four branches, for the supply of the four inner toes, to which they pass between the superficial and deep flexors. The external plantar nerve, passing along the inner side of the corresponding artery, sends branches to supply the outer toe and adjacent side of the next, and then passes, with the artery, between the deep common flexor tendon and the metatarsus, to be distributed to the deep plantar muscles. The posterior tibial artery may be tied behind the inner ankle, on being laid bare in the following way a curved incision, the concavity forwards, of 2 inches in length, is to be made midway between the tendoaculus and the ankle. The skin and superficial fascia having been divided, we expose the inner annular ligament, which will be found enclosing the vessels and nerve in a canal distinct from that of the tendons. Their fibrous sheath having been slit open, the artery will be seen between the vena comites, and with the nerve, in general, behind it. When any of the arteries of the leg or the foot are wounded, and the hemorrhage cannot be commanded by compression, it will be necessary to search for the divided ends of the vessel in the wound, and to apply a ligature to both. The expediency of this measure must become fully apparent when we consider the frequent anastomosis existing between the collateral branches of the crural arteries, and that a ligature applied to any one of these above the seat of injury will not arrest the recurrent circulation through the vessels of the foot. Description of Plate 67 and 68 Plate 67 Figure 1 A. The tendon of the tibialis anticus muscle B. B. The long saphena vein C. C. The tendon of the tibialis posticus muscle D. The tibia D. The inner malleolus E. The tendon of the flexor longus digit orum muscle F. The gastrocnemius muscle, F. The tendoaculus. G. The soleus muscle. H. The tendon of the plantaris muscle. I. I. The vena comites. K. K. The posterior tibial artery. L. L. The posterior tibial nerve. Figure 2. A. The tibialis anticus muscle, A. Its tendon. B. The extensor longus digit orum muscle, B, 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 its four tendons. C, C. The extensor longus pollicis muscle. D, D. The tibia. E. The fibula, E. The outer malleolus. F, F. The tendon of the perineus longus muscle. G, G. The perineus brevis muscle, I. The perineus tertius. H H. The fascia. K. The extensor brevis digit orum muscle, K K. Its tendons. L L. The anterior tibial artery and nerve descending to the dorsum of the foot. Plate 67, figures 1, 2 plate 68. Figure 1. A. The calcaneum. B. The plantar fascia and flexor brevis digit orum muscle cut. B, 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 its tendons. C. The abductor minimi digiti muscle. D. The abductor pollicis muscle. E. The flexor accessorius muscle. F. The tendon of the flexor longus digit orum muscle, subdividing into F, 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 tendons for the four outer toes. G. The tendon of the flexor pollicis longus muscle. H. The flexor pollicis brevis muscle. I, 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 I. The four lumbricals muscles. K. The external plantar nerve. L. The external plantar artery. M. The internal plantar nerve and artery. Plate 68, Figure 1, Figure 2. A. The heel covered by the INT egument. 
B. The plantar fascia and flexor brevis digitorum muscle cut, BBB, the tendons of the muscle. C. The abductor minimi digiti. D. The abductor pollicis. E. The flexor accessorius cut. F. The tendon of the flexor digitorum longus cut, FFF, its digital ends. G. The tendon of the flexor pollicis. H. The head of the first metatarsal bone. I. The tendon of the tibialis posticus. K. The external plantar nerve. LL. The arch of the external plantar artery. MMMM. The four interosseous muscles. And the external plantar nerve and artery cut. Plate 68, Figure 2. Concluding Commentary. On the form and distribution of the vascular system as a whole. Anomalies Ramification Anastomosis. I. The heart, in all stages of its development, is to the vascular system what the point of a circle is to the circumference namely, at once the beginning and the end. The heart, occupying, it may be said, the center of the thorax, circulates the blood in the same way, by similar channels, to an equal extent, in equal pace, and at the same period of time, through both sides of the body. In its adult normal condition, the heart presents itself as a double or symmetrical organ. The two hearts, though united and appearing single, are nevertheless, as to their respective cavities, absolutely distinct. Each heart consists again of two compartments an auricle and a ventricle. The two auricles are similar in structure and form. The two ventricles are similar in the same respects. A septum divides the two auricles, and another the two ventricles. Between the right auricle and ventricle, forming the right heart, there exists a valvular apparatus, tricuspid, by which these two compartments communicate, and a similar valve, bicuspid, admits of communication between the left auricle and ventricle. The two hearts being distinct, and the main vessels arising from each respectively being distinct likewise, it follows that the capillary peripheries of these vessels form the only channels through which the blood issuing from one heart can enter the other. 2. As the aorta of the left heart ramifies throughout all parts of the body, and as the countless ramifications of this vessel terminate in an equal number of ramifications of the principal veins of the right heart, it will appear that between the systemic vessels of the two hearts respectively, the capillary anastomotic circulation reigns universal. 3. The body generally is marked by the median line, from the vertex to the perineum, into corresponding halves. All parts excepting the main blood vessels in the neighborhood of the heart are naturally divisible by this line into equals. The vessels of each heart, in being distributed to both sides of the body alike, cross each other at the median line, and hence they are inseparable according to this line, unless by section. If the vessels proper to each heart, right and left, ramified alone within the limits of their respective sides of the body, then their capillary anastomosis could only take place along the median line, and here in such case they might be separated by median section into two distinct systems. But as each system is itself double in branching into both sides of the body, the two would be at the same time equally divided by vertical section. From this it will appear that the vessels belonging to each heart form a symmetrical system, corresponding to the sides of the body, and that the capillary anastomosis of these systemic veins and arteries is divisible into two great fields, one situated on either side of the median line, and touching at this line. For the vessels of the right heart do not communicate at their capillary peripheries, for its veins are systemic, and its arteries are pulmonary. The vessels of the left heart do not anastomose, for its veins are pulmonary, and its arteries are systemic. The arteries of the right and left hearts cannot anastomose, for the former are pulmonary, and the latter are systemic, and neither can the veins of the right and left hearts, for a similar reason. Hence, therefore, there can be, between the vessels of both hearts, 
but two provinces of anastomosis viz., that of the lungs, and that of the system. In the lungs, the arteries of the right heart and the veins of the left anastomose. In the body generally, not excepting the lungs, the arteries of the left heart, and the veins of the right, anastomose, and thus in the pulmonary and the systemic circulation, each heart plays an equal part through the medium of its proper vessels. The pulmonary bear to the systemic vessels the same relation as a lesser circle contained within a greater, and the vessels of each heart form the half of each circle, the arteries of the one being opposite the veins of the other. V the two hearts being, by the union of their similar forms, as one organ in regard to place, act, by an agreement of their corresponding functions, as one organ in respect to time. The action of the oricles is synchronous, that of the ventricles is the same, that of the oricles and ventricles is consentaneous, and that of the whole heart is rhythmical, or harmonious the diastole of the oricles occurring in harmonical time with the systole of the ventricles, and vice versa. By this correlative action of both hearts, the pulmonary and systemic circulations take place synchronously, and the phenomena resulting in both reciprocate and balance each other. In the pulmonary circulation, the blood is aerated, decarbonized, and otherwise depurated, whilst in the systemic circulation, it is carbonized and otherwise deteriorated. 6. The circulation through the lungs and the system is carried on through vessels having the following form and relative position, which, as being most usual, is accounted normal. The two brachiocephalic veins joining at the root of the neck, and the two common iliac veins joining in front of the lumbar vertebrae, form the superior and inferior vena cavae, by which the blood is returned from the upper and lower parts of the body to the right auricle, and thence it enters the right ventricle, by which it is impelled through the pulmonary artery into the two lungs, and from these it is returned, aerated, by the pulmonary veins to the left auricle, which passes it into the left ventricle, and by this it is impelled through the systemic aorta, which branches throughout the body in a similar way to the systemic veins, with which the aortic branches anastomose generally. On viewing together the system of vessels proper to each heart, they will be seen to exhibit in respect to the body a figure in doubly symmetrical arrangement, of which the united hearts form a duplex center. At this center, which is the theater of metamorphosis, the principal abnormal conditions of the blood vessels appear, and in order to find the signification of these, we must retrace the stages of development. 7. From the first appearance of an individualized center in the vascular area of the human embryo, that center, punctum saliens, and the vessels immediately connected with it, undergo a phasial metamorphosis, till such time after birth as they assume their permanent character. In each stage of metamorphosis, the embryo heart and vessels typify the normal condition of the organ in one of the lower classes of animals. The several species of the organ in these classes are parallel to the various stages of change in the human organ. In its earliest condition, the human heart presents the form of a simple canal, similar to that of the lower invertebrata, the veins being connected with its posterior end, while from its anterior end a single artery emanates. The canal next assumes a bent shape, and the vessels of both its ends become thereby approximated. The canal now being folded upon itself in heart shape, next becomes constricted in situations, marking out the future auricle and ventricle and arterial bulb, which still communicate with each other. From the artery are given off on either side symmetrically five branches, bronchial arches, which arch laterally from before, outwards and backwards, and unite in front of the vertebrae, forming the future descending aorta. In this condition, the human heart and vessels resemble the Piscean pipe. The next changes which take place consist in the gradual subdivision, by means of septa, of the auricle and ventricle respectively into two cavities. On the separation of the single auricle into two, while the ventricle as yet remains single, 
the heart presents that condition which is proper to the reptilian class. The interauricular and interventricular septa, by gradual development from without inwards, at length meet and coalesce, thereby dividing the two cavities into four two auricles and two ventricles a condition proper to the avian and mammalian classes generally. In the center of the interauricular septum of the human heart, an aperture, foramen ovale, is left as being necessary to the fetal circulation. While the septa are being completed, the arterial bulb also becomes divided by a partition formed in its interior in such a manner as to adjust the two resulting arteries, the one in connection with the right, the other with the left ventricle. The right ventricular artery, pulmonary aorta, so formed, has assigned to it the fifth, posterior, opposite pair of arches, and of these the right one remaining pervious to the point where it gives off the right pulmonary branch, becomes obliterated beyond this point to that where it joins the descending aorta, while the left arch remains pervious during fetal life, as the ductus arteriosus is still communicating with the descending aorta, and giving off at its middle the left pulmonary branch. The left ventricular artery, systemic aorta, is formed of the fourth arch of the left side, while the opposite arch, fourth right, is altogether obliterated. The third and second arches remain pervious on both sides, afterwards to become the right and left brachiocephalic arteries. The first pair of arches, if not converted into the vertebral arteries, or the thyroid axes, are altogether metamorphosed. By these changes the heart and primary arteries assume the character in which they usually present themselves at birth, and in all probability the primary veins corresponded in form, number, and distribution with the arterial vessels, and underwent, at the same time, a similar mode of metamorphosis. One point in respect to the original symmetrical character of the primary veins is demonstrable namely, that in front of the aortic branches the right and left brachiocephalic veins, after joining by a cross branch, descend separately on either side of the heart, and enter, as two superior vena cavi, the right auricle by distinct orifices. In some of the lower animals, this double condition of the superior veins is constant, but in the human species the left vein below the cross branch, left brachiocephalic, becomes obliterated, whilst the right vein, vena cava superior, receives the two brachiocephalic veins, and in this condition remains throughout life. After birth, on the commencement of respiration, the foramen ovale of the interauricular septum closes, and the ductus arteriosus becomes impervious. This completes the stages of metamorphosis, and changes the course of the simple fetal circulation to one of a more complex order viz., the systemic pulmonary characteristic of the normal state in the adult body. 8. Such being the phases of metamorphosis of the primary, bronchial, arches which yield the vessels in their normal adult condition, we obtain in this history an explanation of the signification not only of such of their anomalies as are on record, but of such also as are potential in the law of development, a few of them will suffice to illustrate the meaning of the whole number LST, the interventricular as well as the interauricular septum may be arrested in growth, leaving an aperture in the center of each, the former condition is natural to the human foetus, the latter to the reptilian class, while both would be abnormal in the human adult. Second the heart may be cleft at its apex in the situation of the interventricular septum a condition natural to the dugong, a similar cleavage may divide the base of the heart in the situation of the interauricular septum. Third, the partitioning of the bulbous arteriosus may occur in such a manner as to assign to the two aorta a relative position, the reverse of that which they normally occupy the pulmonary aorta springing from the left ventricle and the systemic aorta arising from the right, and giving off from its arch the primary branches in the usual order. Footnote 1 fourth. As the two aorta result from a division of the common primary vessel, bulbous arteriosus, an arrest in the growth of the partition would leave them still as one vessel, which, 
supposing the ventricular septum remained also incomplete, would then arise from a single ventricle. Fifth, the ductus arteriosus may remain pervious, and while coexisting with the proper aortic arch, two arches would then appear on the left side. Sixth, the systemic normal aortic arch may be obliterated as far up as the innominate branch, and while the ductus arteriosus remains pervious, and leading from the pulmonary artery to the descending part of the aortic arch, this vessel would then present the appearance of a branch ascending from the left side and giving off the brachiocephalic arteries. The right ventricular artery would then, through the medium of the ductus arteriosus, supply both the lungs and the system. Such a state of the vessels would require, in order that the circulation of a mixed blood might be carried on, that the two ventricles freely communicate. Seventh, If the fourth arch of the right side remained pervious opposite the proper aortic arch, there would exist two aortic arches placed symmetrically, one on either side of the vertebral column, and, joining below, would include in their circle the trachea and esophagus. Eighth, if the fifth arch of the right side remained pervious opposite the open ductus arteriosus, both vessels would present a similar arrangement, as two symmetrical ducti arteriosi coexisting with symmetrical aortic arches. Ninth, if the vessels appeared coexisting in the two conditions last mentioned, they would represent four aortic arches, two on either side of the vertebral column. Tenth, if the fourth right arch, instead of the fourth left, aorta, remained pervious, the systemic aortic arch would then be turned to the right side of the vertebral column, and have the trachea and esophagus on its left. Eleventh, when the bulbous arteriosus divides itself into three parts, the two lateral parts, in becoming connected with the left ventricle, will represent a double ascending systemic aorta, and having the pulmonary artery passing between them to the lungs. Twelfth, when of the two original superior vena cavae the right one instead of the left suffers metamorphosis, the vena cava superior will then appear on the left side of the normal aortic arch footnote two of these malformations, some are rather frequently met with, others very seldom, and others cannot exist compatible with life after birth. Those which involve a more or less imperfect discharge of the blood aerating functions of the lungs, are in those degrees more or less fatal, and thus nature aborting as to the fitness of her creation, cancels it. Footnote 1, this physiological truth has, I find, been applied by Dr. Arquain to the explanation of a numerous class of malformations connected with the origins of the great vessels from the heart, and of their primary branches. See The Lancet, Volume I 1842. Footnote 2, for an analysis of the occasional peculiarities of these primary veins in the human subject, see an able and original monograph in the Philosophical Transactions, Part 1, 1850, entitled, On the Development of the Great Anterior Veins in Man and Mammalia. By John Marshall, FRCS, N.C. 9. The portal system of veins passing to the liver, and the hepatic veins passing from this organ to join the inferior vena cava, exhibit in respect to the median line of the body an example of asymmetry, since appearing on the right side, they have no counterparts on the left. As the law of symmetry seems to prevail universally in the development of organized beings, for as much as every lateral organ or part has its counterpart, while every central organ is double or complete, in having two similar sides, then the portal system, as being an exception to this law, is as a natural note of interrogation questioning the signification of that fact, and in the following observations, it appears to me, the answer may be found. Every artery in the body has its companion vein or veins. The inferior vena cava passes sidelong with the aorta in the abdomen. Every branch of the aorta which Rami feeds upon the abdominal parietes has its accompanying vein returning either to the vena cava or the vena azagus, 
and entering either of these vessels at a point on the same level as that at which itself arises. The renal vessels also have this arrangement. But all the other veins of the abdominal viscera, instead of entering the vena cava opposite their corresponding arteries, unite into a single trunk, vena porti, which enters the liver. The special purpose of this destination of the portal system is obvious, but the function of a part gives no explanation of its form or relative position, whether singular or otherwise. On viewing the vessels in presence of the general law of symmetrical development, it occurs to me that the portal and hepatic veins form one continuous system, which taken in the totality, represents the companion veins of the arteries of the abdominal viscera. The liver under this interpretation appears as a gland developed midway upon these veins, and dismembering them into a mesh of countless capillary vessels, a condition necessary for all processes of secretion, for the special purpose of decarbonizing the blood. In this great function the liver is an organ correlative or compensative to the lungs, whose office is similar. The secretion of the liver, bile, is fluid form, that of the lungs is aeriform. The bile being necessary to the digestive process, the liver has a duct to convey that product of its secretion to the intestines. The trachea is as it were the duct of the lungs. In the liver, then, the portal and hepatic veins being continuous as veins, the two systems, notwithstanding their apparent distinctness, caused by the intervention of the hepatic lobules, may be regarded as the veins corresponding with the arteries of the coeliac axis, and the two mesenteric. The hepatic artery and the hepatic veins evidently do not pair in the sense of afferent and efferent, with respect to the liver, both these vessels having destinations as different as those of the bronchial artery and the pulmonary veins in the lungs. The bronchial artery is attended by its vein proper, while the vein which corresponds to the hepatic artery joins either the hepatic or portal veins traversing the liver, and in this position escapes notice footnote footnote, in instancing these facts, as serving under comparison to explain how the hepatic vessels constitute no radical exception to the law of symmetry which presides over the development and distribution of the vascular system as a whole, I am led to inquire in what respect. If in any, the liver as an organ forms an exception to this general law either in shape, in function, or in relative position. While seeing that every central organ is single and symmetrical by the union of two absolutely similar sides, and that each lateral pair of organs is double by the disunion of sides so similar to each other in all respects that the description of either side serves for the other opposite, it has long since seemed to me a reasonable inference that, since the liver on the right has no counterpart as a liver on the left, and that, since the spleen on the left has no counterpart as a spleen on the right, so these two organs, the liver and spleen, must themselves correspond to each other, and as such, express their respective significations. Under the belief that every exception, even though it be normal, to a general law or rule, is, like the anomaly itself, alone explicable according to such law, and expressing a fact not more singular or isolated from other parallel facts than is one form from another, or from all others constituting the graduated scale of being, I would, according to the light of this evidence alone, have no hesitation in stating that the liver and spleen, as opposites, represent corresponding organs, even though they appeared at first view more dissimilar than they really are. In support of this analogy of both organs, which is here, so far as I am aware, originally enunciated for anatomical science, I record the following observations 1 st between the opposite parts of the same organic entity, between the opposite leaves of the same plant, for example, Nature manifests no such absolute difference in any case as exists between the leaf of a plant and of a book. 2 ndly when between two opposite parts of the same organic form there appears any differential character, this is simply the result of a modification or metamorphosis of one of the two perfectly similar originals or archetypes, 
but never carried out to such an extreme degree as to annihilate all trace of their analogy. 3. RDLY The liver and the spleen are opposite parts, and as such, they are associated by arteries which arise by a single trunk, coeliac axis, from the aorta, and branch right and left, like indices pointing to the relationship between both these organs, in the same manner as the two emulgent arteries point to the opposite renal organs. 4. THLY The liver is divided into two lobes, right and left, the left is less than the right, that quantity which is wanting to the left lobe is equal to the quantity of a spleen, and if in idea we add the spleen to the left lobe of the liver, both lobes of this organ become quantitatively equal, and the whole liver symmetrical, hence, as the liver plus the spleen represents the whole structural quantity, so the liver minus the spleen signifies that the two organs now disavered still relate to each other as parts of the same whole. 5. THLY The liver, as being three-fourths of the whole, possesses the duct which emanates at the center of all glandular bodies. The spleen, as being one-fourth of the whole, is devoid of the duct. The liver having the duct, is functional as a gland, while the spleen having no duct, cannot serve any such function. If, in thus indicating the function which the spleen does not possess, there appears no proof positive of the function which it does, perhaps the truth is, that as being the ductless portion of the whole original hepatic quantity, it exists as a thing degenerate and functionless, for it seems that the animal economy suffers no loss of function when deprived of it. 6. THLY In early fetal life, the left lobe of the liver touches the spleen on the left side, but in the process of abdominal development, the two organs become separated from each other right and left. 7. THLY In animals devoid of the spleen, the liver appears of a symmetrical shape, both its lobes being equal, for that quantity which in other animals has become splenic, is in the former still hepatic. 8. THLY In cases of transposition of both organs, it is the right lobe of the liver that nearest the spleen, now on the right side which is the smaller of the two lobes, proving that whichever lobe be in this condition, the spleen, as being opposite to it, represents the minus hepatic quantity. From these, among other facts, I infer that the spleen is the representative of the liver on the left side, and that as such, its signification being manifest, there exists no exception to the law of animal symmetry. Tam Myram Uniformitatum in Planetarum Systemate, Necessario Fatendum Est Intelligentia et Concilio Fuis Effectam. Item Dice Posit de Uniformitate Illiqui Est in Corporibus Animalium. Habent Videlicit Animalia Plera Qui Omnia, Bina Latera, Dextrum et Sinistrum, Formicon Simili, et in Lateribus Illis, A Posterio Requidam Corpora Sui Part, Petes binos, ab anteriori autumn part, binos armus, vel petes, vel alas, humerus affixos, interc humeros column, in spinam excurrens, cui affixum est caput, in eo caput binas ors, binos oculos, nasum, oset linguam, semi liter pasita omnia, in omnibus fear animalibus. Newton, optics, Sib de reflex, and CP411. X the heart, though being itself the recipient, the prime mover, and the dispenser of the blood, does not depend either for its growth, vitality, or stimulus to action, upon the blood under these uses, but upon the blood circulating through vessels which are derived from its main systemic artery, and disposed in capillary ramifications through its substance in the manner of the nutrient vessels of all other organs. The two coronary arteries of the heart arise from the systemic aorta immediately outside the semilunar valves, situated in the root of this vessel, and in passing right and left along the auriculoventricular furrows, they send off some branches for the supply of the organ itself, and others by which both vessels anastomose freely around its base and apex. 
the vasa cordis form an anastomotic circulation altogether isolated from the vessels of the other thoracic organs, and also from those distributed to the thoracic parietes. The coronary arteries are accompanied by veins which open by distinct orifices, foramina thebaciae, into the right auricle. Like the heart itself, its main vessels do not depend for their support upon the blood conveyed by them, but upon that circulated by the small arteries, vasa vasarum, derived either from the vessel upon which they are distributed, or from some others in the neighborhood. These little arteries are attended by veins of a corresponding size, venules, which enter the vena comites, thus carrying out the general order of vascular distribution to the minutest particular. Besides the larger nerves which accompany the main vessels, there are delicate filaments of the cerebrospinal and sympathetic system distributed to their coats, for the purpose, as it is supposed, of governing their contractile movements. The vasa vasarum form an anastomosis as well upon the inner surface of the sheath as upon the artery contained in this part, and hence in the operation for tying the vessel, the rule should be to disturb its connections as little as possible, otherwise its vitality, which depends upon these minute branches, will, by their rupture, be destroyed in the situation of the ligature, where it is most needed. 11. The branches of the systemic aorta form frequent anastomoses with each other in all parts of the body. This anastomosis occurs chiefly amongst the branches of the main arteries proper to either side. Those branches of the opposite vessels which join at the median line are generally of very small size. There are but few instances in which a large blood vessel crosses the central line from its own side to the other. Anastomosis at the median line between opposite vessels happens either by a fusion of their sides lying parallel, as for example, and the only one, that of the two vertebral arteries on the basilar process of the occipital bone, or else by a direct end-to-end -end union, of which the lateral pair of cerebral arteries, forming the circle of Willis, and the two labial arteries, forming the coronary, are examples. The branches of the main arteries of one side form numerous anastomoses in the muscles and in the cellular and adipose tissue generally. Other special branches derived from the parent vessel above and below the several joints ramify and anastomose so very freely over the surfaces of these parts, and seem to pass in reference to them out of their direct course, that to effect this mode of distribution appears to be no less immediate a design than to support the structures of which the joints are composed. 12. The Anominate Artery When this vessel is tied, the free direct circulation through the principal arteries of the right arm, and the right side of the neck, head, and brain, becomes arrested, and the degree of strength of the recurrent circulation depends solely upon the amount of anastomosing points between the following arteries of the opposite sides. The small terminal branches of the two occipital, the two auricular, the two superficial temporal, and the two frontal, inosculate with each other upon the sides, and over the vertex of the head, the two vertebral, and the branches of the internal carotid, at the base and over the surface of the brain, the two facial with each other, and with the frontal above and mental below, at the median line of the face, the two internal maxillary by their palatine, pharyngeal, meningeal, and various other branches upon the surface of the parts to which they are distributed, and lastly, the two superior thyroid arteries inosculate around the larynx and in the thyroid body. By these anastomoses, it will be seen that the circulation is restored to the branches of the common carotid almost solely. In regard to the subclavian artery, the circulation would be carried on through the anastomosing branches of the two inferior thyroid in the thyroid body, of the two vertebral, in the cranium and upon the cervical vertebrae, of the two internal mammary, with each other behind the sternum, and with the thoracic branches of the axillary and the superior intercostal laterally, lastly, through the anastomosis of the ascending cervical with the descending branch of the occipital, and with the small lateral offsets of the vertebral. 13. The common carotid arteries, 
of these two vessels, the left one arising, in general, from the arch of the aorta, is longer than the right one by the measure of the innominate artery from which the right arises. When either of the common carotids is tied, the circulation will be maintained through the anastomosing branches of the opposite vessels as above specified. When the vertebral or the inferior thyroid branch arises from the middle of the common carotid, this vessel will have an additional source of supply if the ligature be applied to it below the origin of such branch. In the absence of the innominate artery, the right as well as the left carotid will be found to spring directly from the aortic arch 14 the subclavian arteries. When a ligature is applied to the inner third of this vessel within its primary branches, the collateral circulation is carried on by the anastomosis of the arteries above mentioned, but if the vertebral or the inferior thyroid arises either from the aorta or the common carotid, the sources of arterial supply in respect to the arm will, of course, be less numerous. When the outer portion of the subclavian is tied between the scalenus and the clavicle, while the branches arise from its inner part in their usual position and number, the collateral circulation in reference to the arm is maintained by the following anastomosing branches viz., those of the superficialis colli, and the supra and posterior scapular, with those of the acromyal thoracic, the subscapular, and the anterior and posterior circumflex around the shoulder joint, and over the dorsal surface of the scapula, and those of the internal mammary and superior intercostal, with those of the thoracic arteries arising from the axillary. Whatever be the variety as to their mode or place of origin, the branches emanating from the subclavian artery are constant as to their destination. The length of the inner portion of the right subclavian will vary according to the place at which it arises, whether from the innominate artery, from the ascending, or from the descending part of the aortic arch 15 the axillary artery. As this vessel gives off throughout its whole length, numerous branches which inosculate principally with the scapular, mammary, and superior intercostal branches of the subclavian, it will be evident that, in tying it above its own branches, the anastomotic circulation will with much greater freedom be maintained in respect to the arm, than if the ligature be applied below those branches. Hence, therefore, when the axillary artery is affected with aneurysm, thereby rendering it unsafe to apply a ligature to this vessel, it becomes not only pathologically, but anatomically, the more prudent measure to tie the subclavian immediately above the clavicle. 16. The brachial artery, when this artery is tied immediately below the axilla, the collateral circulation will be weakly maintained, in consequence of the small number of anastomosing branches arising from it above and below the seat of the ligature. The two circumflex humeri alone send down branches to inosculate with the small muscular offsets from the middle of the brachial artery. When tied in the middle of the arm between the origins of the superior and inferior profunda arteries, the collateral circulation will depend chiefly upon the anastomosis of the former vessel with the recurrent branch of the radial, and of muscular branches with each other. When the ligature is applied to the lower third of the vessel, the collateral circulation will be comparatively free through the anastomosis of the two profundi and anastomotic branches with the radial, interosseous, and ulnar recurrent branches. If the artery happen to divide in the upper part of the arm into either of the branches of the forearm, or into all three, a ligature applied to any one of them will, of course, be insufficient to arrest the direct circulation through the forearm, if this be the object in view. 17. The radial artery. If this vessel be tied in any part of its course, the collateral circulation will depend principally upon the free communications between it and the ulnar, through the medium of the superficial and deep palmar arches and those of the branches derived from both vessels, and from the two interossei distributed to the fingers and back of the hand. 18. The ulnar artery. When this vessel is tied, the collateral circulation will depend upon the anastomosis of the palmar arches, as in the case last mentioned. While the radial, ulnar, and interosseous arteries spring from the same main vessel, 
and are continuous with each other in the hand, they represent the condition of a circle of which, when either side is tied, the blood will pass in a current of almost equal strength towards the seat of the ligature from above and below a circumstance which renders it necessary to tie both ends of the vessel in cases of wounds. 19. The common iliac artery. When a ligature is applied to the middle of this artery, the direct circulation becomes arrested in the lower limb and side of the pelvis corresponding to the vessel operated on. The collateral circulation will then be carried on by the anastomosis of the following branches viz, those of the lumbar, the internal mammary, and the epigastric arteries of that side with each other, and with their fellows in the anterior abdominal parietes, those of the middle and lateral sacral, those of the superior with the middle and inferior hemorrhoidal, those of the aortic and internal iliac uterine branches in the female, and of the aortic and external iliac spermatic branches in the male. The anastomoses of these arteries with their opposite fellows along the median line, are much less frequent than those of the arteries of the neck and head. XX The external iliac artery. This vessel, when tied at its middle, will have its collateral circulation carried on by the anastomoses of the internal mammary with the epigastric, by those of the iliolumbar with the circumflex ilii, those of the internal circumflex femoris, and superior perforating arteries of the profunda femoris, with the obturator, when this branch arises from the internal iliac, those of the gluteal with the external circumflex, those of the latter with the sciatic, and those of both obturators, with each other, when arising the one from the internal, the other from the external iliac. Not unfrequently either the epigastric, obturator, iliolumbar, or circumflex ilii, arises from the middle of the external iliac, in which case the ligature should be placed above such branch. XXI The common femoral artery. On considering the circles of inosculation formed around the innominate bone between the branches derived from the iliac arteries near the sacroiliac junction, and those emanating from the common femoral, above and below Poupart's ligament, it will at once appear that, in respect to the lower limb, the collateral circulation will occur more freely if the ligature be applied to the main vessel, external iliac, than if to the common femoral below its branches. XXII The superficial femoral artery. When a ligature is applied to this vessel at the situation where it is overlapped by the sartorius muscle, the collateral circulation will be maintained by the following arteries the long descending branches of the external circumflex beneath the rectus muscle, inosculate with the muscular branches of the anastomotica magna springing from the lower third of the main vessel, the three perforating branches of the profunda inosculate with the latter vessel, with the sciatic, and with the articular and muscular branches around the knee joint. XXIII The popliteal artery. When any circumstance renders it necessary to tie this vessel in preference to the femoral, the ligature should be placed above its upper pair of articular branches, for by so doing a freer collateral circulation will take place in reference to the leg. The ligature in this situation will lie between the anastomotic and articular arteries, which freely communicate with each other. XXIV The anterior and posterior tibial and perineal arteries. As these vessels correspond to the arteries of the forearm, the observations which apply to the one set apply also to the other. Footnote Footnote, for a complete history of the general vascular system, see the anatomy of the arteries of the human body, by Richard Quain, FRS, and C, in which work, besides the results of the author's own great experience and original observations, will be found those of Haller's, Scarpa's, Tiedemann's, and C, systematically arranged with a view to operative surgery. The End End of the Project Gutenberg ebook Surgical Anatomy Updated Editions will replace the previous one the old editions will be renamed. Creating the works from print editions not protected by U.S. copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works, so the Foundation, and you, 
can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special rules, set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, apply to copying and distributing Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark concept and trademark. Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark, and may not be used if you charge for an ebook, except by following the terms of the trademark license, including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances, and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by U.S. copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start, full license the full Project Gutenberg license. Please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works, by using or distributing this work, or any other work associated in any way with the phrase Project Gutenberg. You agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org slash license. Section 1. General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark Electronic Works 1.A. By reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work, you indicate that you have read, understand, agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property, trademark slash copyright, agreement. If you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works in your possession. If you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.e.8. 1.b Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1.c below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. See paragraph 1.e below. 1.c. The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the Foundation or PGLOF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying, or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark license when you share it without charge with others. 1.D the copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, 
distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other Project Gutenberg trademark work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1.e Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg, 1.e.1. The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied or distributed, this ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.e.2 If an individual Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.3 if an individual Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.e.4 do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark license terms from this work, or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark. 1.e.5 Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work, or any part of this electronic work, without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Gutenberg trademark license. 1.e.6 You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up, non-proprietary or proprietary form, including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark website, www.gutenberg.org, you must, at no additional cost, fee, or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7 Do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying, performing, copying or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark works unless you comply with paragraph 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.8 You may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works provided that, 
you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark, but he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns. Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4, Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing, or by email, within 30 days of receipt that s he does not agree to the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of Project Gutenberg trademark works. You provide, in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy, if a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work. You comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark works. 1.e.9 if you wish to charge a fee or distribute a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work or group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark. Contact the Foundation as set forth in Section 3 below. 1.f1.f.1 Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg trademark collection. Despite these efforts, Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects, such as, but not limited to, incomplete, inaccurate or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.f.2 Limited warranty, disclaimer of damages, except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.f.3, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark, and any other party distributing a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work under this agreement, disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs, and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1.f.3. You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive, or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.f.3. Limited right of replacement or refund, if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any, you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you received the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.f.4 
except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1.f.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express or implied, including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.f.5 some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.f.6. Indemnity, you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner, any agent, or employee of the foundation, anyone providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production, promotion, and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs, and expenses, including legal fees, that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur. a. Distribution of this or any Project Gutenberg trademark work, b. Alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any Project Gutenberg trademark work, and c. Any defect you cause. Section 2 Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg Trademark Project Gutenberg Trademark is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged, and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg Trademark S goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg Trademark collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg Trademark and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help, see Sections 3 and 4 and the Foundation Information page at www.gutenberg.org. Section 3 Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501, c. 3 educational corporation organized under the laws of the state of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The foundation's INE or federal tax identification number is 64-6221541. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax-deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84116801-596-1887. Email contact links and up-to-date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website and official page at www.gutenberg.org slash contact section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg trademark depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine-readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations, $1 to $5,000, are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the IRS. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork, and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements.
We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance. To send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state visit www.gutenberg.org slash donate. While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements, we know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted, but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks, online payments, and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org slash donate. Section 5. General information about Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg trademark concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years, he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark ebooks with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark ebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the U.S. unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep ebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website, which has the main PG search facility, www.gutenberg.org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks. Back. 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 Back, 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 back 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 
back, 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 back. Back, 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 back 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 surgical anatomy with 68 colored plates philadelphia blanchard and lee 1859 preface table of contents Commentary on Plates 1 and 2. The form of the thoracic cavity, and the position of the lungs, heart, and larger blood vessels. Description of Plates 1 and 2. Commentary on Plates 3 and 4. Description of Plates 3 and 4. Commentary on Plates 5 and 6. Description of Plates 5 and 6. Commentary on Plates 7 and 8. Description of Plates 7 and 8 Commentary on Plates 9 and 10 Description of Plates 9 and 10 Commentary on Plates 11 and 12 Description of Plates 11 and 12 Commentary on Plates 13 and 14 Description of Plates 13 and 14 Commentary on Plates 15 and 16 Description of Plates 15 and 16 Commentary on Plates 17, 18, and 19 Description of Plates 17, 18, and 19 Commentary on Plates 20 and 21 Description of Plates 20 and 21 Commentary on Plate 22 Description of Plate 22 Commentary on Plate 23 Description of Plate 23 Commentary on Plate 24 Description of Plate 24 Commentary on Plate 25 Description of Plate 25 Commentary on Plate 26 Description of Plate 26 Commentary on Plate 27 Description of Plate 27 Commentary on Plates 28 and 29 Description of the figures of plates 28 and 29. Commentary on plates 30 and 31. Description of the figures of plates 30 and 31. Commentary on plates 32, 33, and 34. Description of the figures of plates 32, 33, and 34. Commentary on plates 35, 36, 37 and 38. Description of the figures of plates 35, 36, 37, and 38. Commentary on plates 39 and 40. Commentary on plates 41 and 42. Commentary on plates 43 and 44. Description of the figures of plates 43 and 44. Commentary on plates 45 and 46. 
Commentary on Plate 47 Description of Plate 47 Commentary on Plates 48 and 49 Description of Plates 48 and 49 Commentary on Plates 50 and 51 Description of the figures of Plates 50 and 51 Commentary on Plates 52 and 53 Description of the figures of Plates 52 and 53 Commentary on Plates 54, 55, and 56 Commentary on Plates 57 and 58 Commentary on Plates 59 and 60 Commentary on Plates 61 and 62 Commentary on Plates 63 and 64 Commentary on Plates 65 and 66 Description of Plates 65 and 66 Commentary on Plates 67 and 68 Description of Plate 67 and 68 Concluding Commentary On the form and distribution of the vascular system as a whole Anomalies Ramification Anastomosis The Full Project Gutenberg License